She's a star shooter for the Silver Ferns, having made her playing debut just out of high school. Maya Wilson not only excelled at netball, but also basketball, where she played for New Zealand and secured a lucrative US university scholarship. But netball was her future. This year, she bravely posted on social media about how she struggled with body image. The post led to an outpouring of support and highlighted the pressures on high performance female athletes. Kia ora and welcome, Maya. Kia ora, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me a part of your podcast. I'm so excited to get stuck into oh, it. You're welcome. We're so excited to have you. And it's been a big week for you and the Ferns. Three games against Aotearoa men. Great to watch and a win in the series for the Silver Ferns. Do you get some downtime now? Yes, thankfully we're on a bit of annual leave at the moment. So we've had quite a chocker. I guess last month we played the English Roses and then had about 10 days off and went straight into a series against Aotearoa men. So it has been very full on, but we are very grateful that, hey, in the world that is COVID, we got to play some test matches and we played some awesome games against the men. So very grateful because we don't know when our next opportunity is going to be. You mentioned COVID and it's been so hard, particularly on the sports and elite sports. Even the game this week had to be relocated from Hamilton at the last minute. How do you and a team cope with so many changes in this pandemic? Yeah, I guess we have to be really flexible. We never know what's going to happen and we definitely take things day by day. But I think we get the easy job of we just get told what to do and where to be. It's the team behind the scenes at Apple New Zealand and everyone else that has to make this moving beast of logistics, which I understand can be very difficult. Um, in terms of being quite short notice too, um, so for them to be able to wrap up a series and for us, we just need to make sure that when we're at home, we're still training really hard and making sure that we're getting all those, ticking those boxes in terms of what we can do away from the team. But yeah, it definitely has been nice to um, be back together again after what has been yeah, very, um, yeah, full of turmoil, I guess. How do you deal with that? Because obviously the plans are changing all the time. Have you got tools that you, that you use to cope when things just change at the last minute and you have to obviously be at your best, at your peak best when you're on the court? Yeah, definitely. I think one of the main things that I focus on is what can I actually control? I can't control the weather. I can't control COVID. Um, but what I can control is how I prepare. So a lot of it for me is the physical side of making sure that I'm able to yeah, get out there and do all the trainings and maintain fitness and as such, and also making sure that we're keeping in touch. We, as a firm, were, had daily Zoom meetings about different stuff that we can still try and keep connected while um, not having the ideal prep. Uh, but making sure that I'm yeah, ticking those boxes, checking in with our mental skills, um, with our psychologists, with nutritionists, all those things that are like little one percenters as an athlete that you want to make sure um, you can put your best foot, foot forward. And so what is your mental prep before a match? Is there a certain, Are you one of those people that has a certain routine that you have to do the same things every time or are you a bit more relaxed? Um, I'm a bit of both. I have teammates who, have, who are a bit superstitious and they like wearing the certain socks and we definitely like eating specific things. I am a fan for a few game day coffees. I'm a fan of a nap. Um, for me, when it is game time and we're heading to the stadium, I have my headphones in. I'm listening to music and really focusing on uh, my strengths. I think that's the main thing. Yes, you play in opposition, but you can't control them. So it's making sure that I can do whatever I can and making sure that I'm, yeah, I guess, mentally sound in a way, which in a high moment is very tough and it's not always easy to be able to get out there and perform but you need to make sure that you can do as best as you can within the moment and how do you, important do you think is that camaraderie that team spirit that you obviously got in the ferns how important is that to your game oh I think it's essential I with us in the silver ferns we know that our strength is in the collective and it's not just the 12 that are in the team or it involves the whole squad so there's about 17 people in our squad and then there may be about 10 sitting outside in our development squad and everyone needs to be on the same page of what our common goal is and for us at the moment it's the commonwealth games of birmingham next year so we're wanting to make sure that um, everyone is on board with knowing our systems knowing our structures our processes but also being able to live uh, the silver fern lifestyle, which is 24-7. People may only see you on the TV, but you never know what you're up to. There's always people watching. 
That's right. Well, let's go back to when, uh, you know, you were the youngest player to ever trial for the Ferns in 2016. But looking back, what was that like for you? I mean, obviously, you also faced a lot of resilience in your life. You lost your father and your grandmother when you were around that age, weren't you? So it must have been a really yeah. difficult time. Yeah, it was a very big turning point in my life. I had just left school and I had been in the all Ferns environment I think the first time I was about maybe 16 and my marama Tomona was the coach at that time and she brought me in as yeah just to have a have a run around and I remember the first time I was in there was against Casey Corpua and, and Casey Corpua is definitely a legend of the game so here's 16 year old me freaking out but <laughs> I guess I've been quite privileged enough to have that pathway and to have the opportunity as a young person to get in and amongst it and I guess they saw me as someone for the future and I guess I sort of feel old at the moment and I'm not even old but I've been around for a wee while so I guess that's where the maturity comes from but yeah over the years I've definitely had to face a few struggles and losing my dad and my grandmother within six months of each other at 18 was very hard and I had just left home too so being born and raised in Auckland and then living on your own in Wellington was a different thing so not only are you just navigating life and trying to be a young adult and a new job and studying but also having to deal with that sort of stuff in quite critical times has yeah has been hard but it's definitely built me up to be a really good person. I mean you were so young at the time how did you get through those that those big monumental events happening in your life? I don't know how you get through it you just cope you go into that fight or flight stage sometimes and I guess I just knew that it was going to be a wave and, and it was something quite different but I guess I am someone who really likes growth and sometimes the hardest things actually make you into a better person so I'm definitely a lot of connecting with family um, having some downtime and being able to grieve was a really important part for me sometimes and in a Māori world and you're in a tangi, you're surrounded by so many people and then they all leave and you sort of feel a bit empty. So it was trying to lean on people. And I think netball was my vehicle to distract me in a way and, and give me something to you yeah, really enjoy. It was an outlet. So I'm really grateful for what sport has given me. And when you play, do you play for, for your whānau? Do you play for your dad? I mean, is that, a, is that inspirational for you? Yeah, 100%. I'm so grateful that... I get to carry my dad's last name. So it's really important for me when every every time I put on the silver ferns dress and I see Wilson on my back, it just gives me that extra bit of pride. As much as I can play with uh, a lot of mana and it's not just about me. And we talk about in the ferns, we're just caretakers. We're only there for the present moment. Um, so you want to make the most of it and leave the dress in a better state than when you picked it up. Oh, that's a really nice way of looking at it. I like that. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, I played netball as a kid. I was in a rep team and I was a shooter as well. And honestly, I had games where I couldn't miss. And then I had games where I just could not get that ball in. How do you deal with that? Yeah, it definitely is shooting. I guess for some people, they love the game of netball, but they never want to be a shooter. It's a high pressure situation you can either win a game and everyone loves you or you can lose a game and it's something that people yeah definitely remind you of and I guess for me I used to be someone who really and well I still am someone who thrived with the under pressure I think within a high performance environment and being on such a international platform that has evolved and being able to deal with uh, criticism especially external criticism that can come earlier on but what I really back is the ability that I have a really close support system and you really got to back yourself even if you're ha not having a bad day it doesn't mean you're a bad player it doesn't mean you're a bad person uh, it's just a game it's just a sport but it doesn't mean that it's going to impact the next game so it's trying to stay present in the moment and it's not the end of the world so you just got to keep going that's right and you know that's the thing I guess you you know you shoot and it misses and you just got to actually put it behind you and think that's not going to shape the whole game it's doing another a whole mm. half to go or whatever is there a way that you do that and you think to yourself I just have to put that aside and think about the next goal or the next game yeah I think it's not trying to connect too much emotion to the, and value to that it's just one aspect of a game and for me it's okay what's next what can I do if I have missed that shot and got the rebound how can I win the ball back um, maybe was there a reason why I missed it come off my hand a bit differently or am I just holding on the ball holding on to the ball for too long so it's thinking about those little short cues that I can quickly change in the moment and 
If not, how can I help my other shooter uh, get into a really good position? So it is a team game, so it's not just me on the court. Um, how can I just use my players around me? Yeah, I think that's really good and a really positive way of looking at it as well. You're always thinking, what could I do better next time? Or how will I be better the next time? Or maybe I could do that rather than, oh, I really wish I hadn't missed that. You know, you don't dwell on it, I guess, is the best thing, isn't it? Yes, definitely. And and at the end of the day, sometimes you're your own worst critic. And there's definitely been games where I felt like I played terrible. And then I actually look at the footage and it's not as it's never as bad as I think it was. So sometimes really reflecting in that way helps. Um, and sometimes you also don't need to listen to all those external people do. Absolutely agree. And I mean, even the same with me when I do a presentation on TV, I think I was crap one night and great the next. And then you'll look at a tape back and realize you weren't quite as bad as you thought you were. So yeah, I really believe that's true. You can often be your own worst critic. Let's talk about that brave Instagram post. You know, you mentioned your inner demons, your struggle with weight. You were weighing yourself six times a day last year and during lockdown. How hard was that for you to post that on Instagram? I think when I originally posted it, I didn't think it was going to get the response that it did. I actually just had these thoughts in my head and I was like, oh, I just need to get them out and voice them. And then I won't keep digging myself a hole and making the narrative bigger than what it was. So that's what I ended up doing. And then when I realized when people were really connecting with it, I was like, oh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. I don't know why, uh, should I have done this? Um, and I think sometimes I've talked to people and if I knew it was going to get their response, I wasn't, I'm not sure if I would have posted it. Um, it was more about me rather than trying to get sympathy from others. And But what I realized from that is that it did connect and resonate with such a massive group of people. And, and it made me feel like I wasn't alone. It made other people feel like they weren't alone. And then it just really reassured me of, how much of a platform I do have and the power of the voice that I can have. So if I can help someone else, that is amazing. It can be quite hard because people see me as an ambassador for the topic now. And I don't know how that sits with me at some point because I still feel like I'm on this journey. Um, where does that leave me? How can I say something and feel like a bit of a hypocrite? But I guess it just shows that this can happen to anyone. It doesn't discriminate whether you're male or female. Um, people have mental health issues and yeah, it is a big thing. And I guess, you know, you said it was an ongoing journey. Do you, are you still suffering? Do you still have days where you, where you try not to get on the scales, but you do? Uh, no, I haven't hopped on the scales in, I want to say, a couple of months now, in a while. And for me, that's big. I think now I avoid the mice and plague. It's not my best friend. And that's one of the things that I'm working on is that I should be able to step on the scales when I need to, not every day, but uh, once a week or whatever the heck that I need to do and be okay with it but I still hold a very emotional value to the number and so that's what I'm currently working on is I need to be able to avoid that and it's just a number it doesn't mean anything as long as I'm fit I'm strong and I'm healthy and I'm able to do my job then that's all that I should be able to accept so that's definitely an ongoing thing at the moment. That's great. Well, and do you think there is a lot of pressure on, on female elite athletes to look a certain way, to be this right body image? Certainly gymnastics, there's a lot of sports right now that are, that are focusing on this issue of body image and how an athlete should look. Yeah, I think it has come to the light recently, in particular in the last year, especially within New Zealand. I've seen a few people talk about the topic and Sometimes I don't know, or from my experience, it may not be from the uh, the sporting governing body themselves that put these standards. I think for me, I put these standards on my own self and being quite a, a strong, young Māori woman had a difference to it too. So I did compare myself to uh, my peers and my colleagues who have beautiful, lean, strong bodies. And I just felt like sometimes I didn't fit the aesthetic and it was something that I tried to fit in with and if sometimes it's changing my language on how I talk about myself that's something that I've really tried to work on but there's also days where I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like I'm strong and I'm awesome like there's nothing else that should matter absolutely and you know I guess the good thing about it is that you know your post can inspire other people and maybe there's a young 15 year old like you that would read that post and say oh that's okay what would you say to someone that's 15 year old maybe your 15 year old self if you could go back and say something to that that girl what would you say to her I think the biggest thing I'd say to myself is to be kind and know 
one body that is perfect there is no typical aesthetic that anyone should be as long as you are healthy is the main thing that I'm trying to push and for me it's like definitely being active but having balance like we can all have a treat or go and have a burger on a day but it's also just living and I think when you take away if you just if you scrutinize yourself and you're very strict on restricting things then that's not really life and it's not living a good life so it's okay um you definitely need to still keep running and exercising because girl your body is going to change over time and it needs to (laughs) but um yeah it's more about living a happy life rather than continually scrutinizing yourself that's exactly right and you you mentioned you had there was a lot of support uh what sort of support did you get from that post I've got oh I remember just seeing hundreds and thousands of comments of messages of young girls and boys actually as young as I want to say 10 um on my Instagram messaging me that they had similar feelings I had parents that were worried about their children um it was quite eye-opening really to see how young people uh, or young kids are that struggle with something like this or at the same opposite end of the spectrum I had other older men and women message me still feeling the same way so that was yeah something that I was like wow this is the power that I had to really touch people and it made them feel better Um, but on the flip side of that they all sometimes they were asking me for advice that I'm not necessarily an expert in. I can only speak on my own experience and I'm not a doctor or a physio or anything, anyone with that much knowledge, but um, that can come with a bit of pressure too, which I found I sometimes I just got quite overwhelmed by the response. I loved it, no, no um, denying that. But yeah, sometimes when people then see you as an ambassador, as a voice, it's, um, it can be another um, challenge. Yeah, it's such a responsibility, isn't it? And what about mm. your Fano? Did you get lots of support from your Fano? Yeah, I'm really lucky and fortunate enough that I have a very awesome support system. Um, my Fano in Auckland, where my mum and my brother and my stepdad are based, have been throughout this journey with me. It's something that those close to me aren't surprised about. So even my teammates in both the Robin Hood Stars and the Silver Ferns, a lot of them had known I was not secretly or silently um, suffering but they knew it was something that I was working through and I think I'm proud of myself of being so vocal and putting my hand up and saying hey I need to see a psychologist who can help me work through these issues or um, maybe I need to talk to my nutritionist and see what the plan needs to be and I'm especially fortunate enough um, for my whānau here in Wellington, in particular my partner who has to be put up with the good days and the bad days on um, FaceTime or physically having to see me sobbing or getting really upset about how I feel. So without those people, I wouldn't be able to be working on myself. And I do really give it up to them because also being the support people can take a toll it's hard when you see your loved one struggling and you don't necessarily know what to do and that's the thing I'm really fortunate about and do you think in the bigger picture in the bigger sense of you know athletes that are worried about body image is there is it something that needs to be changed institutionally at a bigger at a higher level do you think or do you think maybe it's just society and the way we are with social media yeah I think it's a bit of both I think that societal uh ideal that isn't realistic plays a massive part but what has come in particular in New Zealand sporting culture at the moment is that this must be an issue in in various different sports so we need to look at it and I think netball has been really um, open and honest in trying to give us as many resources that we can Um, I'm not the only one and I'm not going to be the last one um, but it's making sure that we can educate in particular our young up-and-coming athletes about this because I would really not like seeing another 15 year old come through the system having to experience the same things that I did so it's hopefully about preventing and educating um, and putting things in place for athletes that are experiencing those things at the moment. So let's talk about the future so you're talking about the Commonwealth Mm. Games so that's exciting what what else are you looking forward to? Yeah, so we have the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham next year, which, fingers crossed, hopefully I'd love to be in that team. I've never gone to a 
Commonwealth Games or netball's not in the Olympics. So that'd be really cool to be on such a world stage and to meet other athletes and see all those different things. So that would be really awesome. And then the following year, we have our World Cup, I think. Oh, I'm not quite sure where they Oh, South Africa we're going to. So that would be really nice to be able to back up a, a being the defending world champions. It's a massive goal for us to be able to back that up and win that again. So, yeah, big things on the horizon. But also I'm in my last two papers of my Bachelor of Communication. So I can't wait to fix that off. And let's just talk about the basketball aspect. So you, we, we mm. split, we divided. Do you want to play basketball or netball? How did that work out? Oh, that was a time in my life that I actually dreaded. I've always loved sport and coming up through the leagues in particular in high school, I got quite good at both. And it was a challenge because sometimes netball like, do you have to go to basketball? And basketball like, do you have to go to netball? But I remember one trip uh, my mother and I took to the States to have a look at college basketball scholarships, go look at the schools. And I remember coming back from that and going straight into the World Cup trial for the Silver Ferns and then after that going to my school ball in between so it's been a very big juggle while I was that young and I guess I always had this goal of being a dual international and I picked being a tall fern off when I was 16 so I wanted to become a Silver Fern and I felt like Netball New Zealand had given me a bit of a pathway to reach those goals so I thought hey I'm gonna take it with two hands and I had to realize what were the pros and cons of both so I was like, free education, awesome opportunity in the States, but also I'm fortunate enough here in netball, I could A, be semi-professional and I could be on a Prime Minister's sports scholarship, so I could still study free. Um, so those, I guess, pros and cons helped me make my decision. I don't regret it at the moment because I'm very happy with how my career has uh, paved its way at the moment. I do really miss basketball and I wish I could do both at the same time uh, but I, that's not realistic in today's climate of how professional both sports are and I wonder if I'd actually be any good anymore because I feel like I wasn't too bad on the dribble being a talk, being a big but I feel like <laughs> I've lost all those things now but I must say I don't miss running up and down a court all the time I do <laughs> like my 10 meter third in the ball. <laughs> Well, I think you'd probably be surprised how good you'd be at basketball as well. It's pretty incredible to be representing New Zealand at both. Do, do you set goals? Are you a big goal setter? Have you always set goals? Yeah, definitely. I've always, I've always wanted to be the best of the best and whatever I wanted to do. So when I realised that I wasn't too shabby at the old sports, I definitely wanted to hit those pinnacle national teams. And for me now, later on in my career, there's those pinnacle events are massive for us in terms of what we call cycles in sports. So World Cup and Commonwealth Games for us is the big event. So I definitely want to see myself in those teams. I've been sometimes the 13th player in the last, I guess, five years of the Silver Spoons Fringe. So I want to be in that 12 this time and I want to be contributing and having an impact it doesn't have to be on the court. Ideally, I'd love to be on there, but any way that I can contribute and help my team, uh, the better. So yeah, I'd love to be there. I'd love to see myself, setting myself up for uh, life after netball because that's really important too. So being able to take opportunities with two hands and whatever that looks like. Well, I think the opportunities are going to flow. Maya Wilson, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been absolutely awesome to have you. Oh, thank you so much. I loved our little chat. Oh, so did I. All right. See you soon.